traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nations. And this territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by this dish with one spoon agreement. And it's directly adjacent to Haldeman Treaty territory. So we acknowledge this because we acknowledge we have a debt to those who were here before us and we recognize our responsibility as guests to respect and honor the intimate relationship indigenous peoples have to this land. So I'm here to talk about, um, I, I was really, I loved Cyan's keynote yesterday about her travels to space, and I was definitely one of the ones that put my hand up, I want to go to space. Um, and I uh, thought, oh, it's kind of, it's nicely tied to this project that I've been working on with a, a group of colleagues from other institutions in Ontario. Um, and it is on Beyond the Exam, and we kind of think of it as the final frontier when we're working, especially in teaching and learning spaces and helping faculty adopt um, open pedagogies and alternative assessments, that assessments really are something that often, often if people even use open textbook and open materials, they still do a traditional exam, and, and we'd like to change that a bit. So we had to, we decided to come up with this project, and, and I'll talk a bit more about it now. So I'd like everyone to go back in time, and maybe you have to go back in time a little bit more, uh, further back than others, but um, to your own educational experience. So just think about that for a minute. What assessment did you learn the most from? So I'll give you a minute to think about it. Was it perhaps an exam? Was it an experiential opportunity? Was it a presentation that you had to prepare for a class? Um, was it an essay or paper that you wrote? Was it a project? Um, was it a portfolio? Or maybe it was other. So think about it for a minute when you think about your experience of what you learned the most from in an assessment. I'm going to ask for, a, instead of a mentee or fancy, fancy schmancy way of getting your responses, just to raise your hand. And So did anyone learn the most from, from writing an exam? No hands. <laughs> okay, so, and that's probably the, the most frequent form of assessment. Did anyone learn the most from an experiential opportunity that was assessed? I see, I see a few hands, a lot of people in maybe, I don't know what field you're in, but in health sciences and clinical placements might, might uh, relate to that. Um, did anyone learn the most from doing a presentation in front of a group of peers? Yeah, that's me too. I find I learned the most from preparing. That's a, there's a lot, a lot of people in the room felt that. What about preparing a portfolio? There, there's a few hands, yeah, yeah, and a, a lot of um, programs don't actually include that, so maybe that's why we didn't all have that experience, but I think it's a great way to assess your learning, especially through the trajectory of a program. What about a large project? I, I wondered if that would be the most, and I think it is, so that's, that's a, a wonderful way of project-based learning, of course, is a great way to assess. And then other, maybe there's a category. Any, any others that I didn't have on this slide that you maybe learned more from? I was hoping there'd be someone, because then I'd ask you. There is, I, just keep that in your mind, because at the end when the questions are, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you to share it. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, not many people learn very much from exams, and that is the most traditional form of assessment. I, well, at, from my institution experience at least. So how we evolved this project was um, with the pandemic, we at McMaster and the institutions that I collaborated with, we all were faced with the, um, realization, or not realization, more the unfortunate request that we had to obtain proctoring software, which uh, many of us were opposed to. Um, and we know that there are many issues with proctoring software and, and some of them, uh, but the basic um, issues are with tech, technical issues. So it's not really, it doesn't really actually work. It's easily circumvented. Um, equity issues, more importantly, when you know students need to have access to robust internet, the need to be in a calm uh, place that uh, they are able to do an exam that's free of distractions. They need to have a robust computer, and they need to also think about their own health. And maybe they have an accommodation or a disability, and the proctoring software just maybe gives an inappropriate red flag. Um, and then also having recognition of time and family responsibilities. And particularly during a pandemic when everyone is already overwhelmed and having to do a proctored exam, um, we, we had discussions with many students who were um, just, it was, it was really heart-wrenching to hear of the experiences that they had with being flagged for inappropriately looking off in the distance like you do, or maybe that was the color of their skin actually raised a red flag, which is a really... Um, 
unfortunate and I think something that we should work really hard to, to not um, use proctoring software in education. So we did have to, we did get proctoring software anyways because some of the professional uh, accreditation required an exam and so we couldn't tell uh, the Canadian Medical Association, for example, that we can't have an exam, we're against it. But, so we had to use it in certain circumstances. But when we talked to faculty, we found that the most, uh, the, bar the biggest barrier to looking at alternative assessment was they just didn't have the support in looking in their courses and developing assessments. So they needed instructions on how to integrate them into the class. They needed rubrics. They needed examples of the assessment that was being completed by other students. And often we need, they also needed assistance with the technology if it was a, there was some technology integration. Um, so, and we all, we realized that faculty were also similarly overwhelmed, so they didn't have, just learning to teach online for the first time was enough. Um, so support, they really needed that support with these, um, these uh, type of, uh, of inclusions, the instructions and rubrics, examples, etc. So we have, we're really fortunate in Ontario to have um, eCampus Ontario, which many of you may be familiar with if you know um, David Porter or Lena Patterson, who often come to the OE Global, Lena is the chair. Um, they had a virtual learning strategy funding that was available two, um, two years ago, uh, and we applied. They had a category, Digital Fluency, for educators. Uh, we had a collaboration, so McMaster University, where I'm from, um, we worked with Brock University, which is in near Niagara Falls, Ontario, and then College Boreal, which is in northern, it's a Francophone institution in northern Ontario. So the three institutions applied, we received some funding, and we were able to get the project going. We used the funding largely to, to pay students and conduct French translation. So we formed our development team. There was multiple people from each institution. Um, we had faculty representation, teaching and learning staff, and students as well. We connected uh, either through real-time virtual meetings or through Microsoft Teams and have um, developed the project. So when we first um, decided um, what the outline of the project, we knew that we had to have, uh, we really wanted to build it around the exemplars and the, the kind of documents that instructors could uh, really requested that they needed for their courses. And we used a lot of our student discussions to come up with what the type of assignments that the students found most valuable. So we basically outlined the projects having an introduction, some ex a bank of exemplars, and we built this in Pressbooks, and we also have a WordPress landing page. And again, we did translate it into French. So that was also part of the budget. So let's take a look at it. So there's the website, beyondtheexam.ca. This is their landing page. Hopefully it goes up okay. There we are. So here we are landing in our Beyond the Exam, and we have a little bit of information around what the toolkit is. There's the English version and the French version, um, so you can access either. But an important part that I wanted to point out is, you, do you have an alternative online assessment to share? So there's a little submission form here. So if anyone has an interesting assignment that they'd like to add to our bank of exemplars, we have about, oh, I should have counted. We have about 24 or so um, across disciplines, across um, like from an introductory level class to a more advanced group projects, individual projects, formative and summative assessments. But we really want to build this out to be a big, robust alternative assessment bank. Let's go up back up and take a look. I'll just let me know how I'm doing for time too. Am I okay? I'm looking at my facilitator. Okay, okay, thank you so much. All right, so let's go back here and I'll show you I'll show you an example of one of the exemplars and I'll point out a couple of things. So we did a little bit of custom styling to press books because we wanted it to look a little bit snazzier. Um, and here we are over contents. So so the, the introduction is here. Oops, sorry, hang on. I'm not used to this Windows. So we had a student pr perspective just talking about how they wanted alternatives to conventional exams. Um, it's a great opinion piece written by our students. They had the instructor perspective, which is a wonderful faculty member from Brock University, and I'm totally um, in alignment with her style of designing a course is after week eight consolidate. So after week eight, she does not introduce any more material. That's when you assess all of the content that you've introdu introduced in the first eight weeks of a traditional 13-week course. 
We also applied Bloom's taxonomy, if everyone, anyone's familiar with that taxonomy of learning and how you scaffold to deeper learning. So we did tag each of the assignment exemplars with uh, the Bloom's taxonomy levels, looking for those you know, higher levels of analyzing, creating. Uh, so we talked about that in case, we just gave an overview of Bloom, so in case people were familiar with that. But the, the bulk of the book or resource is in this, Let's see if I was right, 20, oh, I said 24. Okay, I'll take a look at this one. This is uh, one of, since most of us mentioned project as being one of the most uh, pivotal assignment examples in your educational history. Uh, so here's an example of a multimodal cum culminating project. So each example, we use the same format. So we have a description of what the assignment is. We have guidelines. Um, there's the guidelines on this particular um, assessment. So you could do a multimodal narrative, you could do a multimodal presentation, you could do a media artifact. We have proposal documents that can just be copied over and used for the instructor. There's a metadata document for, for students. Uh, feedback and critique, so how the project is assessed. And there's the evaluation criteria there, so you could use that for development of a rubric. And then we also included technology used for each of the examples in case they did use a particular technology and needed a little bit of tips for students on how to use that. We also included facilitation tips for the instructor, so just how the project or how the assignment had gone historically, um, what, um, what the student feedback was like, maybe things that you might want to consider if you're considering implementing into a class. And then we also included student examples. So that was the basic format for each of the assignment examples. And that's, so, and so our, our, our hope and dream for this is that we have more assignments added, more exemplars from each of you maybe. Um, but we also have other plans. We want to keep this project sustained and used. Uh, we originally intended to include a workshop design, so a whole part to the press book on how you might, if you were in a teaching learning profession, facilitate a workshop on, the, on alternative assessments with you know, slides and activities and, and, and stuff like that, but also have a self-paced um, opportunity for people who just want to go through and consider it on their own. So that is underway right now. It's not quite ready. We're, the English version is complete, but the French version is currently being translated. And we also realized that you know, we have a small bank right now that we've started with, um, but we, want, we hope that this will grow to be hundreds, if not thousands. And if um, Pressbooks doesn't actually, isn't actually the best way to host these, it might be confusing, but we have to figure on how to categorize those assessments by individual, group, formative, summative, um, maybe by disciplinary area. So that's, that's our next steps in this project beyond the exam. And we are, I just want to do another plug for more exemplars. So please consider any exemplars that you'd like. Even if you're thinking, Joanne, I have this idea that I'd really like to talk about. Um, I don't have all the instructions. I can interview you and get all the instructions and do all the work for you. So um, we really would like to see that grow. So thank you so much. I just wanted to thank the, the McMaster, Brock, and Boreal development teams and all of you for your attention on this. If you do want to get in touch with me, either here, I'm wandering around the conference, but you can also email me or find me on Twitter. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, there's a mic up here, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Johan, for your presentation. It's very interesting. But my question is not for you. It's for the two people on the, on the room here who said that they have other kind of exam or something like that. I would be interested to hear about it. Oh, the other, pro the other projects? Yes, yeah. other kind of project, just to know. So sorry about that. Yeah, okay. The, I want to bring the microphone down because it was you were... Sorry, microphone. I can actually bring one. Oh, no, there not. there's one wireless one here. Oh, here it comes. 
So anyone who, I think it was anyone who said that they had something. Okay, you're pointing. <laughs> Thank you. There. Yeah. And you. Yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for this presentation and I think the, the first, the introduction with how do we learn more with which exam, it, it's very, very relevant because we have loads of exam in QCM and, uh, and it's not the way we learn. And the project-based exams is, is really, really um, impressive and I'm using it. But um, when I think about how do I learn the more, the most, it's without any evaluation. It's my free will and my mm -hmm. interest, and it's very related to the project I'm uh, working with. So it's, I think the project base is um, very interesting because it's leading the people to what they will do in the future as well. They, it's preparing them to, to learn by themselves uh, to achieve the big project. That's a really good point, and that's actually when we were talking about the project, of course, we were talking about ungrading and how we maybe we, how do we capture those, um, there really is an experiential learning when you're working on a project and learning the most, and how do we capture those, so definitely um, how to be more creative and more personalized, I guess, into people, how, the way that people learn. But I was wondering, your, your, yes, down here you had the, um, you put your hand up for an other assessment that was the most valuable for you, and what was that? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Juan. And um, maybe the, the first thing that, the question that you have asked from what, which assessment have you learned much, um, brings me to a reflection. It's not yet mature in my head, but I think that the future would be like uh, learning activities and assessment activities will converge. So they wouldn't be two different things. Yeah. Uh, because actually we assess to make sure that they have learned and if the mechanism is the same to assess that learning has occurred and then we don't need any other assessment mechanism. Yeah. And actually that driven me has driven me to uh, three assessment methods that I had in my classes and uh, for which I have an excellent feedback from the students and the really serious students that I, I know they, they, they want to learn, they don't want the grade. Uh, the first thing uh, was uh, uh, simulations. Um, I'm an pro information systems professor, so I teach uh, ERP technologies and s things of the sort. And if you just tell them what is uh, enterprise integration, they wouldn't, they wouldn't understand unless they wear different hats. So the project is just simulations about mega softwares where they play uh, roles of uh, production managers, the warehouse, whatever, and mm -hmm. uh, procurement specialists. And they do the, hel the whole thing. And actually, maybe in, in a day or two, they understand the whole curriculum of one year where you had to explain different modules, different roles, different privileges, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, simulations was one. The second thing I uh, used and uh, that was also uh, very well appreciated is um, evaluation through uh, content development. There is a famous saying of Albert Einstein that uh, says that I, I cannot really, t don't take me by the word, but the meaning was if you cannot explain something, so probably you can, don't understand it from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So I brought uh, my students uh, to produce uh, pedagogical videos about uh, technology and technology concepts and technology usages. And uh, uh, I was really, it, 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 they proved me that they understand everything first. Second, I think that they have the, e even presented bits and pieces that I couldn't present myself in this way. Yeah. So uh, this was great. Uh, the third was uh, um, debates driven by learning objectives of a certain course. Mm -hmm. So I had group, this was very difficult to scale because debates were different topics and you had to, they had to defend against different questions and this had been, you should have been leveled. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry, is there a question there? No, those, are, those are great, yeah, thank no, you. No, no, I'm yeah. answering the question yeah. that was asked. Okay, okay. Uh, so they were leveled 
to, to level them because it's not the question addressed to everyone or it's not the, the same exercise, but this also did great because they could find arguments and statistics and different things from the curriculum. Itself. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Thank and you. I know that I'm going to be co contacting you I'm for examples. Because, you know, I'm a Canada yeah. graduate and I'm very yeah. much biased yeah. to Canada. Oh, great. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, simulation, teaching a lesson is, is kind of the second, and then the debate, they're wonderful examples. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation and this idea. It's great. Uh, I wanted to know about feedback. So, uh, what do you mean uh, by feedback? Is it... Um, I don't know, is it uh, the results uh, well, of uh, the exercises yeah, I, or yeah. uh, a sort of uh, uh, satisfaction uh, right. from students or? Both actually, you? yeah. It was, uh, we had feedback from, from instructors who had implemented the assignment example, you know, how they found it, what tips they would give another instructor, so that kind of feedback, and also the feedback as, as what they heard from students. Yeah, it, usually it's just data that we are already have collected through a course evaluation, so that is shared back anonymously, of course, to us. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, I, I'd like to ask you a last question, maybe. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so, thank you very much for your very nice presentation. Um, my question is regarding Actually, actually, my colleagues asked me first to ask a question regard, regarding the licenses for, uh, for sharing. Yes. And the second one, my question is uh, regarding the standards or the norms that you may be used for, for the design of the assessment, yeah. uh, whether you are conform for, uh, to IMS QTI uh, question and test interoperability standard which uh, makes maybe the interoperability of uh, sharing and exchange, exchanging these uh, resources among platforms. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I think I, uh, well, all of the assessment examples, anything contained in the book is CC by NCSA, so freely use and adapt and share. And yeah, so I'm not sure I understood your second question. I'm sorry, yeah. The, the format? Yes, the, yeah. the format. If it's adaptable? Definitely, yeah. And we're even finding that the technology used, we didn't really apply in some instances. It's like a learning management system or a word, you know. So yeah, we definitely see that we see some adaptability that we might want to add different categories, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think I have just one last question. Oh, sure. Um, just a quick one. Where do you see this being, um, you know, transformed or used in the next two years? Well, that's where we want more examples to come in and to become like the source that people, I know there's like, we're so lucky we have so much. So even when we first uh, were helping faculty with alternative online assessments, there's so much out there available. So we're just looking to hire more student development teams and getting, um, asking instructors if we can use and build to our bank of exemplars so we have a lot and have them categorized so people can easily find them. So communicating and disseminating and, and hearing about how people, what the value that people ha find with the resource and, and growing it from there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>